Protecting yourself from fake news. Hands-on with Canon's new full-frame mirrorless camera. And get a smart home theater with Polk's command bar. Live from the Twit Studios in Petaluma, California, it's the new screensavers. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of the new Screensavers is brought to you by WordPress. Reach more customers when you build your business website on WordPress.com. Plans start at just $4 a month. Get 15% off any new plan at wordpress.com slash NSS. Episode 173. I am Megan Maroney. I'm Rich DeMuro. Leo is gone, obviously. So we get to stand in his space and sit in his chair and... All kinds. We're just like the kids playing when the parents are not home. You know <laughs> what true. I mean? Yes. Uh, so yeah, this is the show where we have fun talking about all the things that we're interested in technology. And uh, we have some things that we're interested in talking about today. I think uh, we have uh, two... Uh, inventors, two young inventors who dropped out of college, um, but they're doing some amazing stuff to to protect us from fake news, which is a term the, I don't like. College is on hold. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's on hold while they just, you know, get the startup kind of where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, ha oh, I should probably silence my computer here. Uh, we're also going to talk about iPhones uh, that were announced. Big uh, news this week. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is a good news week. Because think about it. I mean, you have a, a device that, I mean, what do they, they ship their two billionth iOS device. I mean, you've got a lot of people using these things, and this is the week when they announce the new ones. Mm -hmm. A lot of interest in that. Uh, do you use an iPhone, Rich? Uh, I do, <laughs> yes. No, I don't have it right here with me. I knew, I knew you were going to get me on that. Uh, I have, uh, today I'm carrying the Note 9 and the iPhone 10, And so there's a little rivalry. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Note 9, you know, it's, it's still holding... I do think the, let's put it this way, I think the new iPhones, these two, I, see, I don't think people decide anymore between them. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of people are just in their world, and most people I talk to, like, when I first started reporting with tech, I'd be like, oh, switch to this or switch to that. But now I just feel like people just have what they have. Mm -hmm. And especially with iPhones, the thing is, when it breaks, they go in for the new one. They don't even kind of, like, consider it until they, unless you're a real techie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yes, I brought my Note 9 and my iPhone 10. And my regular watch. <laughs> I've been trying to. I just feel like there's no one out there that is that really doesn't prefer one to the other. And so you keep saying that you. I like do have both. my preferences. You do. Oh, I do. Yeah. Which is it? I'll tell you. Here's the thing. <laughs> okay. Here's how I see iPhone versus Android. Android gives me 100% control over every single thing I want to do on my phone. Right. If I want to change the theme, the background, the icon, the shortcuts, home screen shortcuts, want my icons in a weird little circle, and I want one on the home screen and three on the other iPhone is amazing for content creation to me, mm -hmm. so and simplicity. You know what I mean? Like my mom is not going to sit there and arrange her icons in a weird U shape because she can on Android. You know what I mean? So to me, it really comes down to that. And I think when I talk to a lot of people with iPhone versus Android, a lot of them they've heard that Android is very complicated, so they don't want to deal with that. And with iPhone, it's just kind of de facto nowadays. Like you get an iPhone. Mm -hmm. Like that's you have to almost convince someone why they don't shouldn't get an iPhone, right? Yeah, I mean unless you're on a budget, then it's easier to convince someone not to get an iPhone. There's more <laughs> choice with Android, especially when it comes to like, hey, my budget is 300. Mm -hmm. What can I get that's really good for that? And um, I think we have a mailbag question about we that do, later yes, on. We do, yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. So um, what? Did, we're also gonna cover a sound bar that I tried, and um, we've got a lot of uh, different things that we're gonna be talking about, and we're gonna talk about a mirrorless camera. Mm, Canon. The Canon EOS R. Um, and we also have in studio uh, Ro uh, Robot Labs co-founders Ash Ba and Rohan Pate. They are going to talk about their tools to help protect you from fake news. And the latest being a browser extension that can spot a misleading or photoshopped image using machine learning. So these are two hot topics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. 
I'm obsessed with that kind of stuff because it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very curious to see what they've yeah. what they've done over there. I'm excited to talk to them. But we should talk about the Apple event, which you attended mm -hmm. in the Steve Jobs circle in the round. They did not uh, announce a round watch, as I hope. Isn't that funny how that was like the big? Uh, oh, there's my uh, there's my YouTube video that I was reading the comments on last night. So <laughs> if you want to direct uh, direct to my brain, just write something on that video, and I will read it. Um, well, wow, look at this a rare YouTube. Um, <laughs> Mishap. <laughs> when does that ever happen? Yeah, it's just there's too many people commenting. Oh, right there's now. too many people watching my video. <laughs> I'm sure that's. It what is it funny because you never know. So last year, I did a video on the iPhone, the iPhone 10, for Facebook, 22 million views on that thing. That's a lot. That's insane. Yeah. Now this year, and I, you know, and it was, anytime you have something that changes that much, mm -hmm. that's it was the interest was there. Right. You know, this year there was a lot of interest because people want to see what would change. Yeah. Not much mm -hmm. changed. Um, but the videos are still doing well, but not as much. Um, at the event, this was the second event at the Steve Jobs Theater, which is an amazing place. I mean, we were there the second day after we were done shooting everything. We went back to do our live shots with TV news. You shoot your story, and then you go back and you present it, right? You know, you stand out there. Mm -hmm. From 4 a.m. when I got there until 10 a.m. when we were done, or the place opened about 9, they had people cleaning. And I'm talking the most detail-oriented company it's just amazing to me. Like, it really is. Like, yeah. you don't see that anywhere else, yeah. you know? Um, anyway, that was a little <laughs> personal of being there. It's just, it really is amazing, like, just the attention to detail that that company has in every aspect of an event they throw or how they make their phones. It really does show. Yeah. I uh, Someday I hope to go to the Steve Jobs Theater. Um, so, you know, maybe I could hold the camera next time for you or something. Uh, you know, even my photographer's not allowed in, except oh. at the part where he shoots the stuff. Oh. They don't let him into the... The presentation. Wow. It's very particular. You yeah. know, it's 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 not just like like with something like CES. They're like, oh, who are you bringing? I'm yeah. like, I sent them a list of like 15 people, right. like including like just random yeah. friends that want to go. <laughs> Sorry, CES. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. Uh, but it's true. It's like all these other tech events. It's like the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. Apple is not like that. Like yeah. you're like, oh, and I'm bringing my photographer. They like vet him. Mm -hmm. Like how long has he been shooting? What kind of camera does he use? Does he use an iPhone? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He's obsessed. Uh, or so you said. Okay, so let's talk about the phones that were announced. Mm -hmm. There was the 10S, the 10S X, S Max. See, you already said X. No, I said X. This is the thing. Look at this. A Season Pro, mm -hmm. and you're saying X. Mm -hmm. I say X like half the time. It's really crazy. Yeah. Um, but the naming conventions, the one we didn't say was the what? The, the 10, 10 R. R, mm -hmm. which is even more complicated. I think they should have gone with 10 Plus. Why, yeah. why does it need to be R? Yeah. Or, uh, sorry, let's see. So, not the, not the R, the, instead of Max. Yeah, Max. Yeah, it should have been, it why does it have to be Max? Because it's the biggest one ever. But it's not. It's the same size as the 8 Plus. No, it's bigger. The screen is bigger. The but screen the, is But bigger. the actual phone is like, I bet you a case from the 8 Plus will fit on the 10s Max. Yeah. Well, it's a 6.5-inch screen. Minus the cutout. Yeah, it wouldn't fit because the, the cameras are different, right? The cameras go in a different yeah. way. So. Yeah, but still, I'm just saying. You can, <laughs> if you have a case from your old phone, just take a little scissor and cut right. the little... Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. don't probably do don't want to do that. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> so, the, the yeah, I think they were trying to say, like, this is the biggest screen ever. And, um, you know, they, they have all kinds of marketing words for all this stuff. So, yeah, the, the 10X, X, 10S Max. That's a 6.5-inch screen. That is the one that um, I ordered. And so far, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it on launch day because I wanted the space gray, mm. and the, my date is the 24th. So, but I don't they know. do that a lot, though, don't yeah. they? They kind of yeah. play. And I was reading like some blogs, and they're like, "Oh, if you haven't ordered, you better get it in now because you may not get it for weeks." Mm -hmm. They do. That. When you're talking about a, a phone, especially, I mean, the Max, there, I could see how that one might take a little bit more to get. But if you're talking that the iPhone 10s, which is in basically the same shell as last right. year's, yeah. There shouldn't be any production problems with that. Right. Um, and then they, of course, played the game where the iPhone XR mm -hmm. doesn't come out until later because if you're really anticipating a new phone, you kind of just jump and you're like, all right, look, I'll just get the new, latest, greatest, and I'm not going to save the money on the XR. What do you think about the XR? Well, first of all, I think that um, there was some news that came out, maybe it was rumors, but that they really did have production problems with the screen, and that's why it's not out. They're not trying to pull some... Oh, come on. LCD screens have been around forever. There is no... And it's not curved. There's nothing special. Like, if you look, one thing that's really interesting about this screen, 
on the 10R, if you look at the corners, you see that big, thick kind of black bezel around the whole mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. That is not what the iPhone 10s looks like. Ah. Um, so if you notice with the 10s with the OLED screen, they really kind of turn the edges yeah. into like the edge of the phone. Mm -hmm. This one does have a very pronounced bezel around it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't think there's any production delays with this device. I think it's just, it's marketing. Yeah, but last year they came out with the cheaper version first, and then the, like the 8 came out, and then... But again, that was to build up interest because everyone wanted the new one. Right. Apple is very smart, and I'm not, look, I mean, I would do the same thing. They're, they're trying to f get people to say, like, this is the latest, greatest. You know what? I'm thinking about going for that cheaper one, but this one's available right now. I don't want to wait. It's only $250 more. Let me go with the better one. So, I mean, it's all, you know, they have... I think they have some pretty smart people thinking about this stuff. <laughs> I think they do. Um, so the 10R, I think, is fascinating because really they're taking, they're trying to get more people to buy a higher-end phone by making it slightly cheaper, right? So it starts at 749 or 745 or something, which isn't cheap, um, but uh, it's cheaper than a $1,200 10S. So I think they're trying to bring it to more people who don't want to drop a, more than $1,000 on a phone, but they do want the newest. And a big screen. So when you think about going into the store, and of course your eyes are drawn to the 10s Max, right? Mm -hmm. And you see that, and then your, your jaw drops at the $1,450 for that Max configuration. Mm -hmm. But then the Apple guy says, oh, by the way, you know, you can get, we have this thing in the corner, and he like blows it off with the dust. He's like, <laughs> and he's like, this is only 750. Yeah. And you're like, wait, that screen is just as big and it looks just as good. Sold. Right. So I think that's part of it is like you're still getting a really nice device. And the fact that they put the same camera, same processor, or very similar camera because it doesn't have a dual lens, um, but the same processor, it's almost like nearly the same specs, mm -hmm. which I really got to give Apple credit for because you would think they would have put last year's guts into this device. Mm -hmm. They didn't. So I think major props to them for actually giving us the best. But you're basically giving up on the screen and the build quality but 99% of people are going to put a case on this thing anyway, so it's not going to matter that it's made from aluminum right. and it feels a little bit cheaper than the iPhone XS. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but you can't get a smaller XR. There's no XR that is hand size, small hand size. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I, I feel like a lot of people like the bigger screen because it feels yeah. more premium. Like, remember when, like, a, when you had a big screen phone, you were like, that's like driving, like, a Lexus down the road. Mm -hmm. You know, I got this phone. Um, I think some people, and it, it doesn't feel too big, you know, even though it's kind of the size of the iPhone, yeah. the plus of right. the old days. It'll be interesting because I, you know, went from the plus phones, I had the 6S Plus and the 7 Plus and the 8 Plus, and then I went down to the 10, and I really do like this size. It is a great size. But I wanted to get the, you know, biggest one because Leo was paying for it, so I figured I... <laughs> Wait, do I get a phone for doing this today? Uh, yes, um, you get a phone oh, and you get a phone. Gets a phone. Look under your seats, guys. But the thing is, I, you know, you don't think that that's a small screen until you compare it against other phones. And that's the thing. Most people are looking at their devices. Mm -hmm. we're, since we're in like a reviewer kind of position, you're seeing a lot of different things. Right. You know, and you're seeing like you've got the small phone next to the big phone mm -hmm. next to the bigger phone. Right. But if you're just purchasing a phone and using it on a daily basis, everything adapts. You know, the way it feels in your hand, the way you see the screen. And it doesn't really, you don't notice a difference until you're with a friend and you see their phone, you're like, oh, that screen's a lot bigger. Yeah. You know, most people aren't just not doing that. On a, right. You know. So you have the Note 9 there, which is bigger than the 10s. Um, do you have, do we have a camera here to look at these or no? Um, a, and then I have my, uh, one of my children was here earlier and left his SE, which they're not making anymore. So that is the evolution. That size. I um, mean, look at this. So this screen, remember when that was big? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just crazy yeah. and now, and now, you know, the evolution of the screens is pretty amazing. And here's the other thing that I've noticed as a reviewer is like when you first pick up a device, you know, it feels a certain way in your hand. Like this was like gigantic, you know, like a, the Note 9, let's say. And after you use it for a little, like a week or so, your muscle memory really does take over. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, now this is still tough to manage, you know, by trying to, um, you know, with one hand. But this, I do think, is probably the perfect size for the average person because Pretty much every hand can fit this nicely. And you look at this, I mean, this is really, really yeah. super easy. Yeah. So I think that most people will probably be fine with the, the larger screen iPhone, like the fact that it's gotten a little bit bigger. Because mm -hmm. it's still manageable. And you're going to put a case on it, hopefully. Yeah, and um, but I am, I am going to miss the SE. Like, I think I just bought this this year for my, both of my boys needed new phones. And, 
it was just a great, it was a great phone for a kid. Um, and, you know, that is kind of forgetful and we'll leave it around. And I looked to see if they had refurbished SEs on the Apple Store and they don't. Um, they do have refurbished 7. But we're going to get to that later, too, when we're recommending reasonably priced phones. They could on. surprise us. You never know. You never know. They could surprise, like, later in the year with, like, an SC. You know how sometimes Apple does things in two ways. They do the giant event where they have, you know, like, the pop, pomp and circumstance. Then all of a sudden, one day, you're just like, oh, we have new MacBooks. And you're like, whoa, yeah. where did that come from? Yeah. Or they just update the website, and it's like, oh, they're just there. Right. So n maybe we'll have that. Um, can we talk about the eSIM? Yes. I think that, or the, the dual SIM, because I think this is really interesting, the fact that they're finally doing a dual SIM. It's funny because all these phone makers, they do these little things, and, you know, like the OnePluses of the world and the, the Huawei's and the Samsung's, but it doesn't sort of come to, like, the masses until mm -hmm. Apple does it, and then it's right. like, okay, wireless charging is a thing, yeah. now dual SIM is a thing. I think that's a really interesting feature for them to build in I know big, it's big in the other parts of the world, but like for the U.S., that's pretty big for people to have that available now. Right. So if you have a work phone and a regular, like a work line and a regular line, you can use both of those. Or if you have an international line, or yeah, that, that's how you, you use travel it. a lot. Yeah. 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 And the way they're doing it is, it's not actually two SIM cards that you put into the phone. One's a SIM card, one's an eSIM, mm. which I also think is brilliant because. Now you're a carrier and you might start advertising like, hey, why don't you activate that second line? Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. use it for whatever. And like now it's a whole revenue stream. And I was actually thinking that Apple, I mean, you always hear these whispers about them becoming an MVNO, you know, and opening up their own wireless service. They could easily do that with the second line. Like just start at like 10 bucks a month and, you know, hey, add a second line to your iPhone for 10 bucks a month. Unlimited talk and text. Yeah, that would be smart for them to do. Could be interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then we should talk about the watch too, mm -hmm. watch series four. There was uh, the big thing I think, I'm like it goes to the corners too and um, has a larger screen, um, more screen area, not necessarily bigger. The watch itself isn't bigger. Um, I guess there was the, the smaller one. Two millimeters, one, yeah. yeah is they both got two millimeters bigger. Yeah, so, um, but their thinner. screen or the whole watch? The, well, it's now, if, instead of, uh, it's uh, 40 and uh, was it 40 and 44? Right, right. It used to be it 38, 38 and 42. Right, okay. So, and it does seem, it does look a little bit bigger. It doesn't yeah. feel bigger. Like, I had it on my wrist, and it didn't feel bigger. Yeah. The screen definitely looks bigger because, you know, they, they play that game where they made it two millimeters mm -hmm. bigger, but they also pushed the display out to all the way to the edges. Like, on your Apple Watch right now, you look, you don't really notice because most of the time it's kind of like black, like whatever around it. Yeah. But if you notice, if you ever have it full color with like a photo or something, you notice there's like a bezel. Right. Now it's kind of like that's almost gone. Yeah. So I have the 44 now. I started the Series 0, I had the 38, and the battery was so, like, wouldn't even last throughout half the day. And so I upgraded to the 44, but I think I'm going to go back to the 40. I think that's a good middle ground yeah. because um, my wife wears the same size you have, which is the 42, right? Yeah, 40, 42, uh, yeah. Yeah. And... Um, I feel like I, I feel like the other one is too small, mm -hmm. and so I think now that they're doing like the forty, it's going to be like a perfect middle ground. Yeah. You know, if you don't if you don't have like a huge wrist, you know right. what I mean. If you have a smaller wrist, it's a better size for that wrist mm -hmm. versus the other one was like a little bit too small. Yeah, um, I think that the health features they built in is pretty amazing. Now I know it's very expensive. The fall fall detection, which I think for the elderly, and it's not just elderly. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone's saying like the elderly, but think about it. If you're like a hiker. Or someone that's like anyone that just, you fall, you have mm -hmm. a problem, whatever. And I was thinking even with like something like a car crash, mm -hmm. you know, you become, they, they sense with these algorithms that something happened, like boom, they feel something, and then you don't move for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could be applied to a wide variety of situations. Yeah, I couldn't help but think of uh, Cheryl Sandberg's husband who died from a fall and no one was there. Exactly. And, you know, there, I mean, that really does happen a lot. Um, and yeah, so I think it's great. It's um, an expensive life monitor, but it's worth the life. Right. I mean, think about it. Like, I, I'm sitting here thinking, like, I need to get one of these for my mom. She lives alone. And, you know, it's like you just imagine, you know, like, what, what would happen if she right. fell, you yeah. know, and she can't. I set up a Google Home, so hopefully she would remember to call. But what if you couldn't? Right. You know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a pretty amazing service. And Apple is really becoming a leader in health now. Mm -hmm. And if you look at them with the things they're doing with the iPhone, with the health kit, and now with the Apple Watch, I mean, all these Parkinson's things they've been doing with like the, I mean, it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody right now can match them. Yeah. 
you know, the, the other watches out there, the Fitbit's not even showing an interest in anything sort of like doctor related, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, the ECG stuff, I'm a little more suspicious of. Like, I was super excited when I saw the event, but then when I started to read into it, um, they have FDA clearance, but mm -hmm. not FDA approval, which is different. It's not like they didn't get FDA approval, but from when I read into it, it's a device like this wouldn't even, the FDA wouldn't even look at it for approval. They would just say, oh, okay, it's clearance. Is it where if it were, um, you know, pacemaker, that would need to be approved okay. because it's like you're really going to live or die based on the pacemaker. But the ECG is a little bit different. So it got clearance. Um, it's okay, but I, I don't know, like I, last night I had a, a friend who's an emergency room doctor and he was over and I told him about it and he was like, mm, so, you know, you would know, like it would call your doctor, but he wasn't that impressed with it and he was a little bit wary of, well, are, you know, people going to be... Um, overconfident. Know, think, yeah, yeah. yeah, or overconfident or constantly saying, like, I'm having a heart attack, you know, when they're really, like, you know, that was, I would joke, like, I'm going to take my ECG all day long, like, because I can. Well, and that's my other question, and, I, and I'm not really sure, but I've gotten a lot of emails and tweets from people that do have heart issues, mm -hmm. and they do think that this is a good thing. Um, but again, a lot of it has to do with, like, what your doctor tells you. Like, I don't know, I'm not really sure, because I don't know about the heart conditions that, like, require this. But the reality is, I'm guessing there's something out there that your doctor is like, look, you got to come in for an e ECG every day or every mm -hmm. couple days or every week or every month or whatever it is. I'm just not clear on what the use case is for when you need to take an ECG yourself. Right. Like, are you just sitting there and you're like, let me just see how my heart's doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's not clear to me. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that Apple's building this into this is a good step, no matter what. I mean, if it's it's kind of like, um, you know, an oxygen sensor in, I think the Samsung phones might have an oxygen sensor for your fingertip, you know? Yeah. Um, and there are times, and I can understand why you would need that, like if you have asthma. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you have like, you have a reason for that. Mm -hmm. You know, with the ECG, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, but I, what else was interesting about it was, did you, were you part of the Apple Health Study? Did you sign up for that? Where you, if you had a watch, mm -hmm. you could just, it was... It was an app that you downloaded. It was the Apple Health Study, and you did, it was, I don't know, three or four months. And you didn't have to do anything. All you had to do was have an Apple Give Watch. all your data over to Apple. <laughs> yes. No big deal. Just give all your vital signs to Apple for three or four months. Yes, exactly. Fine. Well, we're sort of already doing that. But, um, no, I, I thought it was, I want to be part of yeah. health research if I can. You know, sure. I didn't have to do anything. But, yes, they did give away, I did give away some of whatever it was. But they, that's the research that they use to get the FDA uh, clearance. Oh. Okay. From that study, so they, you know, they had people who had uh, AFib or arterial, um, whatever it is, <laughs> atrial fibrilla fibrillation. Yes, it's such a tough atrial word to say. Atrial fibrillation. Yes. Because uh, then you have the defibrillator, which yeah, they put which in places, different. right? Which is different than atrial right. fibrillation. And when we were talking, doing the announcement, I thought it was a defibrillator in the Apple Watch. And I thought that would be amazing. Oh my if gosh, you were just that would be around crazy. A <laughs> if you have a short circuit, like if Samsung made it, it might have been. Yeah, it's oh, true. That's, sorry. true. Oh, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't nice. Uh, but yeah, so they, they use that research um, to be able to give this information to the FDA and now. Um, and yeah. see, I love, and I was kind of being facetious about giving away your data, but that's what I love about the fact fact that these companies, they're, they're in a very interesting place right now. They're collecting so much data from us, the Fitbits of the world, the Apple Watches of the world, maybe the Samsung Galaxy kind of watch or whatever. But the reality is they're, they're finding it tough to figure out what they want to do with it mm -hmm. because it puts the public in a weird place. Like when they start, they can slice and dice your data from your heart like a million different ways, your, you know, your activity and all this stuff. They don't really want to come out with a lot of those studies, mm -hmm. I feel like, because yeah. people get spooked. Right. And we're in this stage right now where we're just starting to accept this stuff. Mm -hmm. And with the Apple Watch, I and mean, when you're talking the heart, the electronic heart monitor that they're putting on there now is like way better than the last one. Right. It's like kind of interesting because now you're getting into like much richer information about mm -hmm. people. Um, and so anyway, I feel like they're in a tough place right now because they, they're sitting there like in their boardrooms are like, we have some really interesting info. But how do we go about this where we can make sure we use it in a good way mm -hmm. and get people on board without everyone saying, ah, oh, no way, I'm not wearing an Apple Watch anymore because I didn't know you were doing that with it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's a tricky place to be. So anything else from the event that we didn't cover? Um, let's see. We did the eSIM. I thought that was interesting. The camera, I'm really curious about the camera because the iPhone camera is amazing, but there are points when it doesn't work as well as some of the other cameras out there, mm -hmm. especially like the low light kind of issues. 
Um, I wish they would have improved the selfie camera because in low light, selfies are pretty bad on the iPhone. Um, I do, I read that they changed the uh, sensor, like actually how much light it's sort of bringing in for the first time in a while. So um, they did mention that in their materials. So I hope that the low light photography has gotten a little bit better. Um, and they always say, like Apple always says, we made the camera better, but the HDR thing, the super HDR where they're merging the data from a bunch of different pictures mm -hmm. is really interesting to me because that's kind of what, well, that is basically what the Google Pixel does. And if the iPhone is doing that now, that'll be really cool. The one thing that Apple does at the event where they have it, the, the lighting is perfect. Mm -hmm. So you take any picture at the Apple event, like you're just like, oh, I want to just see what this looks like. Yeah. It's always perfect. Yeah. So you have to wait till you get the camera in real world circumstances to kind of see how it performs. And I would say the iPhone out of every camera I've ever tested, like a, on a phone, is always, you take a picture, it's going to look good 99.9% .9 of the mm -hmm. time. You know, with Samsung, it's like, really good sometimes and other times you're like what just took this picture yeah. you know one plus same thing it's like great pictures a lot of the time sometimes in certain conditions not so good um but iphone consistently is like just like the average person you give them an iphone it's like oh takes a really good picture right. for most situations and alex Lindsay, who um, we talked about the event and he pointed out in some of those photos when they're showing the bokeh effect you know the blurry background and um, he pointed out how many of those photos where someone was wearing a hat or um, not that photo, but um, because there's blurring at the edges. And yeah. so they took so many pictures of people wearing hats so that you wouldn't um, see the blurring at the oh, edges. Oh, yeah, see, another little trick. Yeah. And here's the thing. I don't, I think the bokeh looks pretty good. Like, I get it. People are always like, oh, the bokeh, like, you could see his arm is a little bit not as blurred. Like, still looks pretty good. Yeah. The, if you're not <laughs> yeah. inspecting the bokeh, yeah. like, it's still pretty darn good. Yeah. And it's a cool effect. Mm -hmm. And you know, look, if you're posting to Instagram, you're, if you want a professional bokeh picture, like, you're going to have to take it with a professional camera, and we'll talk about that later. You know, get a $12, $2,000 camera. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if you're taking this from your phone in, like, two seconds when your kid stopped for one second to take a picture. Right. And it's, like, this amazing blurry background that you can now adjust the intensity of. Still pretty good mm -hmm. for, you know, what we have. And, yes, exactly. you're always going to find the little... It's, you're not photoshopping it. So, right. I mean, you're, you're, yeah. the edges are not going to be perfect. It's a computer figuring this out. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of uh, fancy cameras, should we move on to the fan sure. fan talk about fancy cameras? Um, Richard Butler is here. He is uh, from DP Reviews, and uh, apparently Canon has jumped on the full-frame mirrorless bandwagon with the Canon EOS. Hi, Rich. Hi. <laughs> You have that camera right there. I have, yeah. I've been shooting with it for about uh, about two weeks now, pretty much since it was announced. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty up to speed on it by now. What What do you think of the bokeh effect on the iPhone versus what you can achieve on this? You know, we always see these, like, little blog posts and stuff. It's like, we gave the Sports Illustrated photographer an iPhone to take pictures for the magazine. Like, I mean, you still get better pictures out of one of these expensive cameras. Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the power that... Uh, a phone like an iPhone puts into your hand is incredible, and those images, you know, as you say, you know, if you if you post them on social media, they they look great. Um, nobody's going to look in super close detail, um, but it's 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 still simulated. It's still you know uh, an algorithm sort of adding blur to the back of your images. Whereas you know if if you're shooting on something like this, particularly with with this lens, which has a very wide aperture and and there's a big sensor behind it. You know, the actual bokeh is is smooth and it has, you know, character depending on which lens you use. It's it's not quite the same thing. But can you adjust it after you take the picture? Let's nope. answer the tough questions here. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's a feature of, of the physics of light. Um, it's the way it is. And, oh, uh, and that's see? what ph photography is about for me. <laughs> you just get one shot and that's it. No adjusting yep. later on. No clicking that uh, little edit button on the iPhone. So if it's the physics of photography, then how did, did Apple fool physics? Being <laughs> is, is that the headline I, here? Or you mean real photography? I, I mean, so what Apple are doing is, is they're simulating the effect. They're using, you know, a blur and they're using, um, uh, almost certainly they're using uh, computational photography to understand what the bokeh would look like with a, with a, real lens with a big camera and then trying to simulate that into, into your image um you know and they do it they do it very well um but uh you know i really enjoy the process of taking photographs i prefer you know i really enjoy setting up my camera 
to choose how shallow or deep I want my depth of field at the point where I take the photo, not sitting around idly later going, oh, how would this look? Um, you know, I enjoy taking photos for the sake of taking photos. Tell us about this camera. It's a full frame mirrorless camera. What does that mean? So um, we'll start with the mirrorless bit. Uh, you know, Canon is the fourth company to introduce a full frame mirrorless system. Um, and it's significant because they're the, they're the world's biggest DSLR maker. And in a DSLR, you have a mirror redirecting light as it comes through the lens, redirecting light through an optical viewfinder. Um, whereas with a mirrorless camera, as the name implies, you take the mirror out and you let the light go straight onto the sensor. And instead, you have an electronic viewfinder showing you the light as it hits the sensor. So you're seeing the image you're actually going to take rather than just seeing roughly what the camera will get to see. So, um, and full frame um, means quite simply that it uses a sensor that's the same size as a piece of 35 mil film was uh, in the pre-digital pre era. And uh, just a question, like logistically speaking, because this has no mirror on it, when you take that lens off, are you like literally like, if you put your finger in there, would you be like touching the sensor? Like, isn't that like leave it open to like... Uh, it means you can get dust on it. Um, yeah. Actually, with the, with the Canon, it's the only one where you don't just see the sensor by default. When the camera's turned off, they bring the shutter blades down. Um, but any other mirrorless camera, you'll tend to see the sensor just exposed there. So but you got to be careful. Mind, well, yes and no. Um, bear in mind, a sensor will have a chunk of glass in front of it, um, which will have things like uh, an infrared cut filter and... Um, and possibly an anti-aliasing filter. You know, there's there's something protecting the sensor. You're okay. not going to be sticking your sen your finger onto the silicon. Um, but at least with the, bringing the shutter down, that keeps dust out. Is uh, is mirrorless better than DSLR? Oh, that, that's a controversial one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also, is Apple better than Android? Or both. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go Megan has her standard <laughs> questions for anyone that she's talking to that always need to be answered. Um, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm on safer territory going near the DSLR one. Okay. Um, it's to a degree, it's a matter of taste. Um, in terms of performance, they're now getting to the stage where there's, you know, increasingly little difference between them in terms of autofocus. Um, but mirrorless cameras, because they're not having to flip a mirror out of the way, they can now sh tend to shoot faster. Uh, the Sony A9 can shoot at something like 20 frames a second. Um, but also, it means you get a seamless experience, uh, whether you're shooting stills or video. So in a, in a DSLR, when you're shooting stills, you're, as I say, you're looking past this mirror, um, and it's having to flip out of the way each time it takes an image. But for video, it's got to lock that mirror up, and it means you get a completely different shooting experience, depending on whether you're shooting video through the back of the camera or stills through the viewfinder. On this, it's the same experience. Yes. And for me, that's quite a big advantage. So videos or still the same experience? Absolutely, yeah. And on, on this camera, um, and you know, Nikon released a full-frame mirrorless camera about two weeks ago, and um, Sony's been producing full-frame mirrorless cameras for five years now. So it's on a, its third iteration. So, um, yeah, you get, this, you get very similar autofocus performance in both stills and video, which is something that hasn't been, hasn't been the case up until now. So how is the performance? I mean, you shot with this thing. What, what do you think of it? Um, I'd say it's pretty good. Oh, wow. um, you know, at the, the risk of damning with faint praise. Uh, the sensor in it is very much like the one in the uh, Canon EOS 5D Mark IV, um, which, is, which is, it takes great still images, um, but its video is perhaps not quite up to the same standard. Uh, there's a significant crop on the video, so you're not using the whole sensor. And it was somewhat plagued by rolling shutter. And this is, is a pretty similar story with this one. Um, I love the still images. I've actually rather enjoyed shooting with it, but I, I'm a bit disappointed by the video. Mm. What's the deal with the lens? Like, is like the mount different or something? So yeah, um, taking out that mirror, uh, means that you can move the mount much closer to the to the sensor and that means for instance on this lens and this is the uh this is the 28 to 70 mil f2 this is a three thousand dollar lens it's it's lovely it's quite big um but you can have a, 
I don't know if you can see that. You can have a huge glass element very close, very close to the sensor itself. And Canon, Canon tells us, you know, in as much as you can uh, can trust what you're told by manufacturers, Canon tells us that putting a large glass element very close to the sensor allows you to create all sorts of lens designs they couldn't with their uh, DSLR system. And Nikon is saying very much the same thing. They've taken the same approach, you know, a very uh, a very wide um, lens mount very close to the sensor. And this allows them to make uh, much more ambitious lens designs than they could before. And if they're both saying it, there's probably something to it. Do you have a preference between the Nikon and the Canon? <laughs> I, I don't know. That's I'm very like competitive. Android versus iOS <laughs> in the very... camera world. <laughs> All these controversial questions. I know. All fighting words. Something has to win always. That's my way. I've, I've... I've not shot with both of them enough to really have formed a preference. We're we're in the process of reviewing both cameras at the moment. Um, there's definitely you know there's there's pluses and minuses to each. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not quite ready to answer that question. In the coming weeks, we'll have a review, and then you can see you know our our collected considered opinion. But for now, I'd say you know there are things to things to like and and slight letdowns in both cases. Who do you like better, me or Rich? <laughs> That's an easy one. Do you like the new screensavers better or the old screensavers? So is, is, does this mean that DSLRs are going the way of the Betamax? Like, are they over? Is full frame mirrorless the way we're headed? Um, I think it is probably the way we're headed long term. Um, they're not going anywhere soon. I mean, all the world's best... Uh, Press cameras are DSLRs, you know, the uh, Canon 1DX Mark II, the Nikon D5. Um, these are the things that are uh, lining up alongside uh, uh, the touchline in sports games all over the world. Um, it's going to take a while for mirrorless to really uh, push that away. So in, in the short term, no. In the long term, I think you have to assume this is the way the market's going. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily going the way of Betamax. I'd say that... Uh, DSLRs are probably going the way of vinyl. There'll always be some people who love shooting that way, who want to sort of feel part of the scene in the way that you do when you're looking through an optical viewfinder and you're actually seeing the scene through the lens. There'll always be some people who want that, and particularly Canon and Nikon, I think, will always try to cater to that market. Is there any sound when you hit the shutter because there's no, nothing that kind of flips? Well, on this camera, there is. Um, there's still a mechanical shutter because... Most modern sensors still, or sensors this big, um, aren't fast enough for you to be able to um, use turning them on and turning them off as a shutter. Okay. Um, it, it does have a fully silent mode, but just like I said, there was rolling shutter in, in video. Uh, it takes some time for that electronic you know, readout to work its way down the sensor. And so you potentially get some slight distortion in your images if you use the fully electronic shutter mode. It's only really the Sony Alpha 9 that comes anywhere close to being able to completely do away with the uh, mechanical shutter. So this is a uh, $2,300 camera plus yep. that, you know, you said the lens you're using is $3,000. So this is a very costly investment. Who is this for? Um, well, I think very few people who buy this particular camera body will then pair it with this lens. Um, I think this lens is... This lens says a lot about Canon's ambition for the system. Um, I'm sure we'll see a body that makes much more sense with a three thousand dollar constant f2 uh, constant f2 zoom. Um, there is a smaller lens which, sadly, one of my colleagues is shooting with at the moment, um, which is a uh, 24 to 105 millimeter f4, um, which is a, actually ends up being a really lovely, flexible, sort of travel appropriate lens, um, and that's that's much more reasonably priced. It means you get the the body and the lens for something around, I think it's $3,100, $3,200. And that's comparable to the amount you'd, you'd uh, spend if you were buying a, uh, a full-frame DSLR with a good lens. So it's it's costly, but, um, but that's the sort of amount of money you'd expect to pay for a, a good camera and a good lens um, with a full-frame sensor. Uh, and it's so this is this is really an enthusiast level camera. Um, it's for people like me, really. You know, not professionals uh, necessarily, but but people who care about their photography enough to really you know spend some money on on their hobby, um, spend the money on the thing they enjoy doing because they really want the quality that a full frame sensor gives. So when is it available? 
Uh, I believe it's available next month. Um, I think the body is is October, and the twenty four to one hundred five lens I was talking about is October, um, and then I think this lens is coming in December. Um, so it's it's it all the four lenses they've announced are coming in the next couple of months, um, but but the body is available next month. So if I'm taking pictures of my kids trick or treating next month, do I get this camera with the three thousand dollar lens, or do I just use like the iPhone? <laughs> um, it depends if you're. Um, you know, I mean, do, I, do I buy this for the trick or treating night or what? Do I just plunk <laughs> down the cash? Yes. I wouldn't. I'm not sure that would be the the, the best use of your money. Um, I, it would take it would take some great photos. If you've decided you want to take photos of trick or treating and then re, you know you're really interested in photography and you want to take your photography further than your iPhone's going to let you, you want to have more control and you want. You want that you want that image quality as opposed to a simulation of it, then then yeah you should you should certainly have a look at a camera or one like you know this camera or one like it, but um, but you know it has to be said your iPhone's going to do a pretty good job and your kids aren't going to be intimidated by you running around with this uh, following them. Be the whole scary time. though. So. Yeah, and can I immediately post those pictures on Instagram with that camera? Uh, I wouldn't say instantly. Um, it's got Wi-Fi built in. You can tra- it's somewhat easier to transfer them to Android than it is to iOS. Um, but that's uh, that's a much longer conversation about uh, about iOS. Oh, I'm happy um, to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you, you know you can Wi-Fi them to your phone, and then you can use Snapseed or whatever uh, editing software you prefer to use, and you can post them from there. Um, and actually, Canon is introducing an app. Uh, they already have an app for transferring images, but they're introducing a mobile version of Digital Photo Professional, their uh, raw processing software, to allow you to sort of tweak and optimize your image on your iPad, on your iPhone. Um, and that's, I, I'm not sure if it's available yet, but it's coming soon. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Richard Butler uh, is a a technical editor at DP Reviews. You can check out his uh, review of this. And then apparently soon, what he thinks of this compared to the uh, Nikon, the Canon versus the Nikon. It's dpreviews.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. So we're going to talk to a startup that is working on ways to fight fake news. um, And they're here. But first, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor of this show, WordPress. I have my uh, site. I use WordPress for MeganMaroney.com, also for GoatsWearingClothes.com. I have both of those websites. Um, And I love having a place online uh, that I can call my own, that people, when they um, look for me, they can hopefully find that first. Um, And WordPress helps me do it. I don't have to spend a ton of time thinking uh, about design. And if something goes wrong, then uh, they are there. They have uh, a lot of great service um, where I can, they can help me with things when, when things go wrong. I don't have to worry about security either because uh, they take care of all of that. They take care, they can take care of the hosting and uh, they can take care of the templates and they have so many of them. So you, you, your website doesn't have to look like everyone else's website. You can turn your vision into a reality. All you have to do is launch your website on wordpress.com. You can choose from hundreds of designs to match your vision and establish your brand no matter how much design experience you have. It is hassle-free. WordPress takes care of the hosting, security, and software updates so you can focus on your site. Upload images, video, audio, and more, plus import and export content to and from your WordPress website. It's your site. It's your home. It's your content. No limits. Grow your audience and reach new customers with built-in SEO, social media features, and marketing tools. That's what I was talking about before. So that is the first place people will find you when they look for you. That's what you want. With the WordPress app, you can manage your site on the go, and you can launch your website with confidence, knowing you can get help from a 24-7 support team when you need it. WordPress plans start at just $4 a month, and 31% of all websites run on WordPress. Right now, get 15% off any new plan purchase Go to wordpress.com slash NSS to create your website. That's wordpress.com slash NSS for 15% off your new website, your new home on the web, wordpress.com slash NSS. And we thank WordPress for their support of this episode of the new screensavers. All right, Robot Labs recently launched their latest solution to help stop fake news. SurfSafe, which uses machine learning to help you spot Photoshopped or misleading images with a browser plugin. Joining us to talk about it are returning guests of the Twit Network. Thanks so much for being here. Co-founders Ashbot and Rohan Pate. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Yeah. 
So, Megan, you tried this out. I did, and it, it is amazing. So I should say that we talked to Ash and Rohan uh, on Tech News Today about their first product, that which uh, was amazing, and that detected bots. Um, and I loved it, so I was so excited to hear about this. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it it if I had like a little bit of a learning curve, like a tiny bit of a learning curve, because I didn't really understand what it, it does. So Ash, why don't you explain yeah. first like what it's supposed to do, and then we can talk about how it does that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So when we look at the problem of fake news, there are so many different issues. It's a, it's a massive issue in itself. And so we've been trying to solve a small little issues here and there. So first off, amplification, we looked at bots. And we were like, hey, we're going to build out a simple tool to empower users so that when they're on Twitter, if they're talking to a bot, they should know. And in the same way, we started looking at the problems around uh, actual content and misinformation there. And we realized that uh, one of the big issues that exists today is that there's so much information that it's impossible to keep track of what's real and what's fake. We should all be reading groups like Snopes. We should be uh, looking at these fact checkers, but it's just, it's just so much to ask, right? There's just so much information. And so our whole philosophy was, let's just take that experience and make that so much simpler. Let's make it so that you hover over an image and we give you that information. And so that's sort of been the philosophy around SurfSafe. We're like, hey, let's, let's take the stuff that we should be doing and then uh, package it into a very simple extension. And uh, that's what we've launched. So you install the extension, and then can I just hover over any image or what? Can you give us kind of a, do you have it hooked up here? Yeah, it's it? hooked mm -hmm. up here. Let's see. Let's give us a little demo here. Yeah, so, so you can. I'm on Twitter. Yeah. So as you look at this image here, there's, a, uh, there's, there's this very extreme tweet where they're talking about uh, a NFL player protesting with a burning flag. And so with SurfSafe, you can hover over the image, and it essentially gives you an indicator here. You can click that. And in a couple seconds, it actually shows you where the images have been seen. Oh, so wow. You, so you can actually jump in here and see the different instances. It's been fact-checked. Um, it's also been tweeted out by the, by the Seattle Seahawks. You can check that. Our philosophy here is that instead of uh, pointing out and saying, hey, this is fake news, we want to give you the different sources. We want you to come to that conclusion mm -hmm. and say, hey, here are the 12 different places. If you want, you can read the Snopes article on it as well and just look at the fact-check, right? Um, and so, for example, you can go in here and read Snopes', Snopes long-form uh, analysis of why this is fake. But that's, that's how we've sort of looked at this problem. We know that there are diff a lot of different definitions for fake news itself. And so, as opposed to tackling the classification by itself, we're like, hey, let's give you the information and make that very, very simple for you to see. So if you're just listening to this, we're, what we're saying is the, the photoshopped image of um, we, we, you were able to show the, regu the real image, which is just the football player in the locker room, and then the photoshopped image had the burning flag that someone added there. Um, right. And so, so when you set this up, which is interesting to me, is um, you, you just install the, um, the add-in to your browser, and then you get to choose the sources. So it, it, okay, I was going to ask about that. Like which, how do, where do you pull these sources from? Yeah, is it easy to uninstall and um, yes, reinstall so and show the process? Because that is what I was like, oh, okay, it's not saying like, oh, here are your sources. Um, you know, everyone believes that the New York Times is the, mo you know, the best source for everything. Every, you know, right. it's not that. It's like there's a list of sources. Mm -hmm. There's Fox, Fox News. There's Breitbart. I mean, you know, the, the, you can, let's take a look and see what happens when you yeah. install it. And so when you install, one of the first screens you see is your, your, this option to select safe sources. So we, having built products in this space, we've talked to a lot of users from all across, all, all across the political spectrum. And one thing we're adamant about is that we're nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. And the way for us to do that in a way that our algorithms themselves are not biased is let you decide what our algorithms are based on. So based on that, we took the top 40 news organizations by Alexa rank and then listed them here. And you can choose what organizations you trust. If you, if you trust CNN, you can choose that. If you trust Fox News, you can choose that as well. And based on this, we actually come to the different classifications uh, that we show our users. So for example, let's say you trust something on CNN. CNN has written an article about how something is fake. We'll actually bring that up to you at the top and say, hey, a trusted source has actually represented, the, shown that this content is actually fake news, and you should go in and read that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that's the big reason why we've decided to um, Go with safe sources. And then uh, going back to our bot check, uh, our, the only actual check that we have to, uh, to let you use our product is checking that you're not a robot. And we, we believe that this is so important, especially considering that a lot of the issues that have come up 
around uh, fake news, uh, these Facebook ads that have been uh, polarizing our country have come around people sen selling ads against uh, users. So we actually have almost no information on you in the sense that all you essentially tell us that is that you're not a bot and you essentially are able to use our service. Mm. I, I love this. Um, so does it work mm -hmm. on, it works on any image mm -hmm. on the web? Yeah, so basically we, you brought and saw the extension and it work, runs on any image that you see. So if you hover over any image on any website, we have indicators that allow you to like look at an image. For example, like if there's a warning associated with it, if it's been fact checked before, or in an instance where you can just hit the uh, basically a magnifying glass uh, icon, and that will show you all the instances we've seen that image across the internet. So that way you can cross references the cross reference the sources your, them yourself. Now, a lot of these things, when they kind of go viral, they haven't really been seen before. So how does your software kind of do that? Like, let's say it's a new image. Um, does it take a while for it to kind of percolate and, like, get through the system? Yeah. Like, or, you know what I mean? Like, So one of the uh, amazing things about misinformation is that uh, it, it specifically targets certain demographics. So you and I won't fall for the same misinformation. It'll, uh, it'll essentially look for uh, different biases that we have. And so based on that, uh, for example, when, when I'm going through Facebook, uh, there's, there are all these satire pages that often spread misinformation. And the thing is, looking at this, I know that the Justice, De Justice Department hasn't actually fined the NFL $500 million. Um, and because of that, I can actually report this and uh, essentially tell SurfSafe that I think this is misleading. Um, I can hit report, and we actually use that um, to essentially be able to understand what sort of pieces of misinformation are flowing and our users, our community of surf safe users, are actually the ones that inform inform us in terms of being able to see where fake news is spreading, which essentially lets us see fake news as it starts going viral um, before it really gets caught. Do you have to have a human on your end, or is this AI that you're using to once that's reported, what's happening with that? Yeah, so we have we have filters as well as a human process. But that being said, again, we don't actually make the classifications around what's fake news or not. We just give you more sources. And so one of, the, uh, one of the products we're looking at in terms of in our pipeline is a, a product called factcheck.me fact uh, for news organizations, such that we can actually present uh, pieces of information that people are presenting as fake news or reporting to us as fake news, and so that we can actually give out a report of what's been reported to news organizations so that they can themselves go out and fact check and provide the service for other users. So earlier this week um, on Tech News Weekly, we were speaking to uh, someone from the EFF about how difficult it is for AI to work in situations when someone's trying to figure out um, someone's political leaning. Mm. So mm -hmm. we were um, talking about YouTube doesn't know, for example, what fair use is. So they can't, you know, if I'm showing a picture of Trump, it doesn't know um, that I'm using that. Um, it doesn't really know what my political leanings are or anything. It's hard to teach an AI that. Like, how, so I, I like that this is specified to just the image. Right. So if I, if I were writing uh, an article about that, image and how it was fake and how he wasn't really burning the flag. My entire, my content wouldn't be judged as fake news, correct? It would just be the image that right. was, okay. So the other thing that uh, we find super fascinating is that a article that misrepresents the image, by definition, is going to be misinformation. And so uh, the, and the reason why we're looking at images is it's, it's from a informing the user standpoint, it's so cut and clear. Um, we give you 12 sources and say, hey, we're not going to tell you that this is fake news, but we're going to show you. And that's, that's sort of the philosophy that we've had. Now, I've heard that you can just take an image and drag it into like Google image search mm -hmm. and you kind of get like, you know, you see where that's appeared before. How is this different? What level of um, intelligence are you applying that that's not? Yeah, so one thing that we do that Google image search can't do is we, we're actually able to reference uh, Photoshopped images. So for example, uh, on the screen here, there's a picture of, uh, uh, I think this is Bane from one of the Batman movies. Um, but as you can see here, when we actually analyze this image, we actually get the original uh, image that this is from. Um, and so one of the cool things that we do that Google Images doesn't do is that we're able to reference these images. So they just find similar images. Right. They're yeah. not going to find images that are like the original that was doctored. Yeah, what actually Google does is that they actually look at the image, they look at the different objects in the image, and then basically give you like almost a actual web search for it, and then finds you images of that. So oftentimes if you'll give it a image of a flower, they'll find you visually similar other flowers. Mm -hmm. And so it's cool, you can get information like that, but you don't see exactly the other sources where the exact image, or example if it's from a protest or something like that, where the other places where that image is. And on top of that, the other thing is, there are so many things that we should be doing, 
We should be Google searching images. We should be fact checking images. But the problem is there's so much information these days that I can't fact check every single image. Mm -hmm. And so our philosophy is like, hey, let's just reduce the friction so much that just your computer does it automatically for you. And there's always that like party pooper on Facebook who like posts the Snopes article and you're like, oh, why do you have to ruin it for everyone? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, that puppy and the pony are not really best friends. <laughs> Um, so this is totally free. Um, how are you gonna make money? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, you ask such tough questions. Yeah, Why do. do they need to think about this? It's true. <laughs> well, I guess the way our philosophies when it comes to this is is that we should be aligning our our users' uh, incentives with how we monetize. So, if, for example, our users want us to uh, fight fight back against fake news. And so when we look at avenues to monetize, we're looking at things like uh, looking at providing data to ad providers so that they can be like, uh, this is telling ad providers that, hey, we know what, what is being reported as fake news. Use that in terms of what ads you, you're able to run and not run. Or going to uh, media organizations and being like, hey, your images are being misrepresented. These are different avenues that we're looking at monetization, but we, wanted to, we want to monetize in a responsible way um, where we actually help the issue as opposed to propagate it further. And Rohan, I, I know you both were at Berkeley, and uh, you met at Berkeley, right? Uh, or did you well, meet before? We're actually childhood friends, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty insane. So we went to middle school together, and then high school together, and then mm -hmm. freshman year roommates. Were you part of the yeah. first startup, too? I was not, no. <laughs> so I only dropped out once. This guy dropped out twice. He can tell you about that. <laughs> so you started a company, you started your first company when you were 14. Uh, yeah, when I was 14. Yeah, that's right. That's very young. Well, he's still very young. <laughs> he's only like 17. So. Yeah. Uh, so you left. I mean, I would assume you'd, you sort of have to get on this now. It's changing so fast. I mean, when we talked about botcheck.me, mm -hmm. that was before mm -hmm. Twitter removed all those bots, right? I mean, that was before a lot of people really understood how many bots were on Twitter. Right. The, yeah. the crazy thing, I mean, the, the philosophy that we have is uh, these p big tech companies, because they're so big, the, they, they move a little bit slower than a startup like we can. And our philosophy is that, hey, there's so many people that see this as a big issue and want to do something about it. And our way of uh, helping that is empowering them by building tools that they can just download and start taking action on their end. And, and in terms of bot check, in the past year, uh, over 60,000 users have classified over a million suspicious accounts, which is insane when you think about how just uh, we're just two students, right? Um, I, I like all of that is our users. Like all of the all of the crazy stuff that we've been able to be a part of is because of the people that have used us. And I could also see. I know you guys are you know the money thing, but I could see companies. You can either do this as a subscription. You know, if you're a newsroom, like before we air a product, you know, we want to fact check it mm. through the you know run it through this service. Right. Um, it could be built into a product. I mean, obviously, a company like Facebook might be interested in this technology to you know automatically. Uh, add this into images. Obviously, these are all things you guys have thought of. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? There's like a lot of different ways this can go. Clearly, you have it as a user end thing, but this can be built into a lot of products too. Right, right. And we're looking at a lot of these avenues. We're talking to a lot of different groups. And at the end of the day, this is, for us, this is also a passion project in the sense that uh, we see misinformation as being one of the biggest problems uh, of this next generation. And we want to make sure that we have we have our way of having the impact so that this problem isn't as big as it, as it could be. Um, in, what in what got you interested in that? I mean, is it just being online, seeing what's going on out there, or what, what got you kind of into this realm? Yeah, I, I think it's a culmination of a lot of different things. So for one, we go to Berkeley, and like being at Berkeley, we're often in, in the, uh, we're often either made like, uh, online, there's so much fake news that spreads about our university. Um, from like, uh, we had Milo Yiannopoulos, who's this conservative speaker, come and speak on campus. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing all these uh, pieces of information floating around about how students were paid protesters. And we're like, F we wish we were paid, right? Like, <laughs> so like, we, we've experienced this firsthand. Can we swear on the show? <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we just did. <laughs> we just lost our FCC license. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> he didn't swear. That's fake news. <laughs> Yeah, but being being at Berkeley, you right? really yeah. have passion for it. Uh, I mean, yeah. If you're going to use it, use it in a you know for something you're passionate about. But yeah, yeah, definitely. And then even then, we just started building projects in our apartment. Uh, we were literally in the living room together, just like hacking on some projects, coding some stuff, seeing what we could do. One of the first things that we did was just building uh, presidential actions, which is 
basically an app that just looked at White House, the whitehouse.gov, and basically informed users what the president, what pre actions were like the White House was taking, what actions was your, were your government taking, and how you could reach out to your local representative. And even that, that got like a good amount of reach then. Yeah. And who's doing the website design? Who's like creating these? Because these sites are they're very beautiful. Like it's a good good design. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that that was just something that I uh, I guess back when we launched this uh, put together like a couple of days before launch we were like shoot we have to like <laughs> get this done. But <laughs> yeah, it was a building these pro products and building this company has been an insane experience just mm -hmm. because of uh, how central this has been to like. Uh, we started working on bots, and then all of a sudden, people were talking about Russia bots, right? And as a byproduct of that, so many users just start using our products, and we just start hearing uh, like feedback from everyone from political organizations to big companies to users, and it's been just an insane journey of being tossed into the center of this this uh, crazy time we're in. Um, I want to know what the biggest challenge has been, because I mean, it seems like you're you're everything that you're doing is like very relevant for today's day and age. Mm -hmm. But have you met like a challenge, like, or you know, are there people that don't like what you're doing? Oh yeah, when working <laughs> in ter uh, since we're working on a problem around bots, there there's so many times when I, I'll just have to delete the Twitter app just because my phone just gets starts getting bombarded with like thousands of tweets. Um, there have been writers who've written about us and then uh, have had to delete their uh, Twitter or, like Twitter apps on their phone just because all of a sudden these bots start like just tweeting at them. So that might happen to you guys. I, I don't know. But. <laughs> I would love, like, anyone to Fair warning right before. One tweet reply would be nice. You know? <laughs> but things like that have been, like, uh, it, it, it's weird, right? Like, on one end, it, it's a little bit scary. But on the other, it's, it just shows that we're striking a chord with uh, different groups. Yeah. Do you think the election could be changed with these bots? Like, do you think this is a thing we need to worry about for the next, next go-around? Yeah. Uh, in terms of this being a problem, like, we, we've seen, sort of seen this first and multiple different times. So for example, after the Parkland shootings, for example, um, we saw bots actually tweeting out about gun control on both sides of the debate. So like uh, very left-leaning tweets as well, well as right-leaning. Whereas like there were tweets that organically were popping up like ar around mental illness that weren't getting uh, as much exposure because of these bots actually driving the conversation. Mm. And so we, we've seen these things firsthand. It's been something that has had a lot of coverage and it's been crazy for us as well, just be, just having a product in this space and seeing seeing the data just come in like firsthand. It's so interesting because you you know with this whole bot kind of thing is like they build these systems you know like the Facebooks and the Twitters and like right. these smart people sit there and they say well how can we manipulate that you know and how can we like even like trending terms on Twitter you right. you just think like okay whatever like if you know a company wants to promote a trending term it shows up there but hold on what if I don't want that promoted logo on there and I just want to do it organically right. by creating an army of bots. I yeah. mean, that's something that, like, when you think about the layers of sophistication of these systems, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I, definitely diving in deeply into a bot check, we saw different ways of creating that bot network. You could buy accounts on, like, the quote-unquote black market, and you could just build your own army. And it was really easy to automate. There's a lot of these tools out there that allow you just to automate hundreds or thousands of these bots. And suddenly you can grow your brand organically, or you can grow whatever organically. idea is. <laughs> organically. Right, I mean, it's... Like you yeah. think about that, like that if you're a brand, like this can be used. I mean, we think about the fake news and stuff, but like as a brand, you might be interested in some of these tools that are kind of bad for other uses, you know? Yeah, one of the craziest things that we came across was that uh, seeing all these bots were like, how expensive would it be to like buy a few accounts, <laughs> right? So we go on, we like uh, we go we go to a black hatter site, and we're just like we're just talking to random people. We come across this guy. I think his name was Rick or something like that. He's like, I'm selling accounts. So we email him, and then we're like, how much are you selling them for? It's like four dollars fifty cents, <laughs> and so you can. And, and we got these accounts. We start looking at them. We realize they're just compromised accounts. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're accounts with like full names, like emails, like with followers too. Yeah, with followers. actual networks. Like these people could have been like your high school friends, right? Oh, yeah. That have just like not stopped using their accounts, gotten them hacked, and then their passwords changed. Yeah, my account was uh, was compromised for a while because like when I had little kids, I was like Twitter was the last thing I was doing, and then all of a sudden I started to see tweets that it was like just yeah, it was not me. You I didn't got have it your two factor on back then. <laughs> no, no, it was 2013. No, yeah, um, I didn't. So you used earlier you used the word amplification, like mm. being the problem, which I think is is key to this because I think most. People People in the world are good, um, mm -hmm. but the people who are not are very loud, and technology <laughs> makes them even louder. And so, do you think that Twitter and Facebook have gotten better at managing that sort of amplification from your perspective? It's it's a game of cat and mouse. So, like uh, tw Twitter and Facebook, for to give them credit, like 
they've been this is one of their big problems as well, right? So they've been they've been Twitter in particular has been working nonstop, but at the same time, um, this is this is a group where uh, the other group is also working on technology, and so uh, we we constantly see different things happening where like. Uh, the tweeting behavior that we saw a year ago is very different from bot behavior today. And that, that's also why we've also advocated for other, other groups to start getting into this uh, issue and start uh, working on this problem just because it's, it's a problem with a lot of different actors. Um, and it's a problem that needs to be solved. And every time someone changes something, the guys on the other side figure out, well, let's go to plan B and C yeah. and D. I mean, it's always, it's never gonna, it's not gonna stop ever. Right. There's always gonna be something that's next level. And when you talk about bot behavior being different, you're talking about on the like a massive scale. You couldn't tell me like bots do this and bots do that, could you? Uh, I, I, I guess I can give you a couple of things, but that being said, like uh, on a whole, this is a this is a evolving uh, this is an evolving problem. But for example, like we used to see bots just retweet content, and now we're seeing bots that are essentially taking, for example, to so that they don't get flagged by Twitter, they'll just start uh, posting news articles, posting the exact title of the news article as well as a link. And it looks a lot more like a, a posted tweet. Uh -huh. And so there's behaviors like that that have been changing over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. In my house, the bots clean the floors. <laughs> so, I mean, that's yeah. a good that's a good, this is a good kind of, of bot. Yeah. 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 I'm not reprogramming them anytime soon. I'm not not putting, all bots are bad. Yeah. 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 I'm not putting a stop to that bot army. They just march in, like, we're cleaning. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, that's true. Some, some, just like people, some bots are good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, how do people find out more and uh, about the, the product? Safe? Yeah, so SurfSafe is, Surf in, Surf Safe is in beta. They can go to getsurfsafe.com mm -hmm. and uh, download our extension there. We're, we're working on, uh, right now, we have this amazing community of users that are giving us so much great feedback. And if you want to be a part of, uh, of, this, of this fight uh, against fake news and hel uh, help us with this product, um, we'd, we'd love for you to download uh, our product at getsurfsafe.com. Awesome. And is it Chrome? It's Chrome right now. We're working on a Safari, uh, Firefox, and Opera uh, version of the extension as well. Mm -hmm. awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, <laughs> you guys for having us. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are going to do the mailbag, answer a couple of your questions. But first, I got to take a look at uh, a soundbar from Polk. And uh, Florence Ion and I give a review right now. <laughs> Let's start with this long, giant thing that I have out there in front. This is the Polk command bar. This is a sound bar. If you watched my smart home tour, then you know my house was sorely missing a sound bar for great sound. And so Polk sent us this sound bar for review. It's called the, the command bar. And it is not quite as expensive as a HomePod, and neither is it as expensive as Sonos. And uh, some may, uh, might argue that it is not as good. And if you're looking at it, you can see it's $300 right now on Amazon. Uh, if you're looking at it, it looks like a, an Echo Dot has been dropped right there in the middle, that circle there. It's not It's not an Echo Dot. It's not a sound bar with a hole for your Echo Dot. But um, it does have Amazon in in it, as you can see when I said her name. Um, as many third-party devices, you can't change the name. Um, you can't change the wake word. So we're going to have to say the wake word and um, and hopefully we'll mute it out um, when you're if you're downloading this, if you're not watching live. So I can say, play Believer. Here's Believer by Imagine Dragons on Amazon Music. Whoa, that's a shaky table. It, yeah, so it has a subwoofer here, this giganto thing, um, and I wish you could feel it. Well, if you put it on the floor, I could imagine you could. Yes. Um, and, well, I know you could feel it. I wish you guys out there could Stop playing. <laughs> so if you have works. played it music, me. yeah, it did hear you. If you've played music with any of these smart devices, you know that when you have it turned up loud, you're often screaming and it doesn't hear you. This one comes with a remote, which is nice. Oh, um, that's good. You can just press we the we were, I mean, admittedly, we did have a couple of issues getting it to to quiet down after having it play at max volume. But I guess it's good to know that it's uh, it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> it gets loud. <laughs> so it, let me tell you what it comes with. It comes with an HDMI connector for your TV. Um, if you have that port, if you have just the optical port, if you have a little bit of an older TV, it comes with that setup That's as nice. well. It's really easy to set up. There's a hole in the back um, for an uh, Amazon Fire TV if that's what you use and um, you know, can just hook that right up there. If you know sound, if you're familiar with sound, you're you're familiar with Polk. They've been around forever. John was telling me about his Polk speakers that he had back in the 70s, um, back in the day. So they are a trusted brand. I know music aficionados say, oh, that doesn't sound as good as the Sonos, but I think it sounds just fine. Yeah, and uh, it's also worth noting that there are sound bars out there with the Google Assistant built in from Vizio and JBL right now. They're slowly trickling into the market. So if uh, Amazon is not your thing. There's always a Google alternative. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there'll be plenty more by the time the holiday comes rolling around. Yeah. So um, this, I, I think that this is a good buy, especially if you are fully into the Amazon ecosystem and you like to use it. You, I mean, you can do, you can't do. The ecosystem means a system formed by the mm -hmm. interaction of the community of organisms with their physical environment. <laughs> you could ask questions um, as she just displayed. She could be listening to you. It could be listening to you when you don't want it to be listening to you, all those things. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's it's $100 less than the Sonos Beam, um, which is their sound bar. So, you know, you can um, make that decision yourself. And I have another Polk product here. Um, this Polk Smart Speaker uh, is in your ecosystem. So oh. I can say, hey, what's the weather? Currently in Petaluma, it's 69 and mostly cloudy. Today, it'll be partly cloudy. With a forecast it is cloudy. And a low it is cloudy. So I have found that setting up the Google Assistant on the speaker has not um, been very easy. And it was the same experience I had setting hmm. it up on the other third party speaker hmm. the, with the screen. Play music. To hear that on YouTube, you'll need to sign up for YouTube Music. Did you set your default in the Google Home app? Um, I. You can change your default music provider in the Google Home app. I did that. So here's the Google Home app. If um, we can take a look at that, um, I wish that it would take. There we go. So here's the defaults. Do 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 do. Um, so I want to. Set the default as Google Play yes. or Spotify. Or whatever you have a, an active account set on. If None you don't have an active account on YouTube, then you should select uh, either no default or Google Play Music because you already have, I mean, you already have access to that through your Google account. But not free. But oh, well, some, Yeah, you still have some streaming. So it has streaming. So I could say, hey, Google Play Music. Playing some music. There you go. Google Play music. See? And then it'll play it for you. You just can't be as specific as you'd want to be with the service that you pay for. So I can't say, hey, play Believer. You could. That song's only available for Google Play Music subscribers. There you go. But try this Google Play Music Believer station. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a station related to the song that you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. But because we'd like you to pay the $10 a month, I mean, yeah. when, I mean, at this point in at this stage of the game, you kind of expect that if you want to listen to music. So I wouldn't recommend these devices unless you're already a YouTube subscriber or this or a Google Play Music subscriber. If you go to Prime or if you have Apple Music, these aren't going to be very helpful. But if you do, unless you have a local server of music, that's true. Um, but this one also, uh, you can group multiple um, Chromecast enabled speakers. Yeah. So if you have other ones, you can group them all together all in multi-room sound. So if you're really into multi-room sound and having everything play the same thing, then that would be a good I choice. am into that. But weirdly, these are both from Polk, the sound bar and this speaker, but they can't connect to each other because that one is in the Amazon ecosystem and this one is in the Google ecosystem. Yes. Precisely, but mm -hmm. that's because there's one for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. We're just talking about our connected home. Yeah, here. You know, <laughs> just typical conversation, Spotify versus Google Music versus Apple Music. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're right. I think a lot of people in the future will pay for multiple services. 
But you had a good point that because I said I finally like Alex Lindsay last week convinced me like what's the big deal like if you really like being able to tell your HomePod to play whatever you want and you really like to have your Amazon Echoes play whatever you want why not just subscribe to Spotify and Apple Music? But you had a good point about yeah, machine mine, learning. Yeah, mine's not really like I get it. Like I have Google Music, so I pay for YouTube Premium, which gives you Google Music, and then I also have uh, Spotify, which I do the family plan and share it with like every family member I know. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Um, but, you know, my point is, like, I like Spotify to learn about me. So I always feel guilty when I use my Google Music because mm -hmm. I like some of the playlists, the song, the old songs of playlists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like in those times, Spotify is not learning about me. And then it's kind of ruining the algorithm of the Discover Weekly and all mm -hmm. those, you know, they do like five playlists now. Plus that old, like, they do like the five playlists that are custom. They do Discover Weekly. And then what's the other one? The, the flashback. Which one? Oh, really? Release. release radar. Oh, you got that one, and then also the time capsule. So I mean, oh, yeah. and they're so pretty. They're pretty hearing. good. Yeah. Like they, you know. So anyway. That's true. And well, my algorithm's all mixed up with my kids too, and not just recently. It's like what my kid, you know, what my kids liked in third or fourth grade. So yeah. That's the other thing. I think they should add, and I think they need to start thinking about this. There needs to be a reset button on your account. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like reset the algorithm. Like give, you know, just start fresh. Yeah. You know, like I, I okay, fine. I was into musicals. You know, <laughs> country music for a little period of my life, and now yeah. I just kind of want to wipe that. Yeah. It's all about electronic. What's the EDM? It's yeah. all about EDM now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, life doesn't have a reset button, Rich. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> See, Spotify is teaching me life lessons. Yeah, exactly. And I didn't even know it. Yeah. Okay, you're right. I'm going right, to live I... with my past music mistakes. <laughs> with that, I think we have time for the mailbag. Here it comes. <laughs> a, a gentle push. Thank you, Colleen. Oh, we got mail from Leo. He's been sending us postcards. You get one. These are so cool. Um, they're Bill Atkinson's uh, photo card postcards. You can get one question. Okay. Leo didn't ask us any questions. No? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, actually, he on this one, he says, please tell Rich that he answered all of those questions wrong on the tech guy. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it that, Leo. Say that. Were you listening from all this from this? Yeah. Is this, yeah. Where, is this where you're listening, Leo? <laughs> this is is this like actually what he's on right now? Um, this looks amazing. That probably was what he was was on. I mean these are his well, these photos. are from like yeah. yeah. So this is this app you basically take a picture and print it out and send mm -hmm. a postcard with yes, it. That's it's, amazing. Uh, Bill Atkinson who worked on the first um, Apple computer and uh, and he is an amazing guy, and he comes. He has the service, and yeah, you just take a picture, and you know, Lisa's on the stamp. Does you have Lisa on your stamp too? Or? I do, right there, right in the corner. <laughs> I will say though, I would feel a little self-conscious being in this pool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it's not that great. You have to go in the pool in front of everyone. <laughs> yeah. So. And the people taking pictures. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so I'll pass. It's been. I mean, we're having a lot more fun than they are, don't you think? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> All right. Do you want to uh, answer your question? Um, or I'll start. We both. Do we have both questions? Let's see. Which question do you have? Uh, we both have both questions. You. You read the first one. I have the Echo Dot question. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll answer that one, and you can answer okay. my question. All right. So I will read the question for you. Okay. Okay. Hi. I love using my Echo Dot for listening to radio stations and your podcast here in the Sierra foothills. However, when I ask for your podcast, I can only retrieve the latest episode. Can you tell me how to retrieve previous episodes through the dot? I do watch them via YouTube, but sometimes I just want to listen. Thanks, Don. Oh, sorry. Thanks, comma, Don. Don, yes. And thanks, Don. <laughs> um, I almost exclusively listen to podcasts through my Echo Dot. Um, and what you can do, you ask it to play, like, play the new screensavers, and then it'll play. What's the syntax without um, saying, without activating? Play I, the new screensavers on TuneIn. Okay, so you have to go through a third party. Usually, I think what, it starts to learn a little bit. I can just sometimes just say play. Yeah, it's through TuneIn, but I think for certain podcasts that they know that I listen to all the time, it will just play it. Okay. Um, and then if you don't, if you've already listened to that, then you can just say skip. And then it'll go the next one. Say you want like three or four episodes back, or ten episodes back, or the first. Um, I recommend a skill called uh, Pod. What was it? Pod. Any Pod. 
Um, and it's a free, obviously, uh, Amazon Echo skill. And so you just enable AnyPod. And you can, you can do this through the um, app on uh, your phone, the, the Amazon app, or you can usually, now you can enable skills just by asking the Echo to enable skill AnyPod. And so then you just, have, you could say, play the new screen, ask AnyPod to play the new screensavers episode 160 or play the new screensavers episode 12. The other thing you can do... Oh, wow, on any pod you can just yes. call it out like yes. specifically. That's pretty yeah. good. The other thing you can do is you can fast forward or, you know, rewind, which you can't really do very easily. You can't do on TuneIn. So, um, you know, if we, uh, if you, you wanted to get through us um, babbling about our um, smart spe speakers, which I recommend you not do, you can just say fast forward five minutes. Or if we said something amazing, which right, we did a lot of. Right, that's what I would of, say. Go back. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let me hear that again. Yeah, so you can say go back. And then you can subscribe through any pod. So you can say, you know, subscribe to the new screensavers. And do you have a podcast? I do. Rich uh, on Tech. Rich on Tech, yeah. yeah. So you, I, can and you can actually, I enable the flash briefing. So mm -hmm. on me, I say, I think it's like, a word, enable the rich on tech flash briefing. Um, but on Google Home and also on um, Siri on HomePod, it's really easy. You just say, listen to the rich on tech podcast. Oh. Um, and I don't know, I tried it in my car today. I was trying to do like, you know, listen to the episode before mm -hmm. and it didn't really work. So, oh, yeah. but I feel like that's the next kind of um, level of all these voice assistants is we, I always say, like, like I asked you, I was like, oh, tell me how you have to say it. Yeah. In the future, hopefully we won't have to figure right. that out. You know, like no, you just, you just say what you want to do. Right. Hey, listen to last week's episode of the new screensavers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's how it would be done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So once you subscribe to all those on AnyPod, you can just say, ask AnyPod to play my podcast and it'll play them in a row. So you have a rich on tech flash briefing. Yeah. Like we do. You know, that's another thing. It's very hard to find the flash briefing skills because I constantly, I, I, that's how my morning routine is flash briefings, and I don't have quite enough to get through the entire. Oh, you gotta add routine. rich on tech. I know. I how do. How long is your routine? Because I do mine. <laughs> I have mine set up for my car, my way to work. It's 20 minutes. I actually do the Google one. So I say, um, "Hey, whatever, mm -hmm. play the news," and you go in on your app on Google Assistant, and you actually choose your news. Um, you guys are one of them. Um, your your show, the uh, this week in tech. Mm -hmm. uh, no, tech news tonight. Tech News Weekly. Tech News Weekly. Yeah. That's the one I have, like, it's my, like, that's my... Oh, that's part of your news. Yeah. Okay. So, but you only ha only select shows are in there. You can't add any podcast. Oh. So that's, like, the little trick. Like, your show's in there, but, like, other shows I want are not in there. So oh. it's, like, interesting how, I don't know what the delineation, if Google chooses. Yeah. Like, I can't add mine, my own to that. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. It's like, I don't know how, anyway. Well, you should talk to pa Patrick, who's the uh, master of that here. Um, Probably talked to Google and was like, hey, will you add this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you we do, do to get your show on the yeah. flash briefing? Yeah, what can I do? Yes, exactly. It's like in a dark um, room. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that, that works. Okay, now I'm going to read the question that you're going to okay. answer. Hello, I am 58 years old and probably one of the last eight people on earth that don't own a cell phone. I have now decided to change that. Can you recommend little tech illiterate me a cell phone? Not too expensive with the bells and whistles I need nowadays. Oh, easy iPhone 10s Max. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, ten, nothing, nothing but There's the best. Nothing else. Yeah, you just. I mean, <laughs> look. Yeah, with yeah. the 512, yeah. uh, it's 1,450 dollars. <laughs> That's how tax. much you pay these days. And I'd recommend getting the silicone case. Um, let's mm -hmm. see what else you need. Apple Care. Apple Care yeah. That's another 200. Right. Um, Probably want a dongle because they don't include it anymore. Right. That's nine dollars. Yeah, probably a leather case. Why? Why silicone? Yeah, go with leather. Yeah, because okay. yeah. yeah, it, it ages nicely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and leather's nice because it says like you know I'm mature. Uh huh. You know, yep. so it's mm -hmm. like ages. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. you have a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, well, he said he was 58. <laughs> yes. And he said he was like, what do you say? Not tech literate? No, no, he's not. Uh, he's tech illiterate, or mm. so he says. He can't and... be that tech literate if he's watching yeah. Twitch. That's so I gotta good... give him props for that. And um, I just want to know how he survived without a cell phone. Like you, that's, yeah, that's crazy. He I doesn't almost, own one at all. He says oh, last, he doesn't own wow. a cell phone, and I I kind of want to say, Mike, keep at it. Like you might be the last one. Why not be the last one? No, because if you then you also need to get the Apple Watch. Because if you fall, and Mike, you're kind of <laughs> getting to that age. <laughs> Mike, you are not you getting fall, to that age. You fall. Sixty seconds. You know the Apple Watch will take care of you. So I think. You're looking at total $2,700. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. that's a pretty simple solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, or, <laughs> or you can, I mean, there's a couple ways. You can either, you know, if you want to do the whole iPhone thing, you can do that. They don't really make the SE anymore. Mm -hmm. 
You were saying you couldn't even find it refurbished? I couldn't find it refurbished as of now. No, I got it refurbished about six months ago. You might be able, I mean, I would check. I would personally, I would probably go iPhone, to be honest, like over Android. I think it's a little bit easier. Um, and here's the thing, the, the unsaid thing about iPhone is that when you have a problem, you can ask people. Android, you need to have some nerdy friends, mm -hmm. right? To like be able to ask things You're like, hey, how do I set up this thing in Tasker to like automate my, you know, now nobody's gonna know how to do that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? With iPhone, you can ask random people, hey, how do I turn on the timer for the camera, you know? And like, that, that's a big kind of plus in having that. So I say, uh, go to the Apple refurbished website, see if they have an iPhone that you like from there, get like one that's not too expensive. Um, if you don't like that Gazelle, mm -hmm. you know, you can go and you can go on there and buy a refurbished phone. Um, I think you're looking at a refurbished iPhone. Yeah, and if you don't want that, what's the cheapest they're selling now? The iPhone 7, the I think, 7, is like the... Yeah, and the 7 is also, you can get that refurbished, too, for only $375. Okay, so, so oh, here we go. Here's the... So what yes. do we have here? iPhone 7, look at that, 32 gig, unlocked 379. I think that's perfect. And that comes with a year warranty. Which yes. is why I like, because you could get it from Gazelle. I don't, I don't remember what Gazelle's warranty is, but don't buy it from someone on eBay or no. Facebook or anything or like that. or definitely not Craigslist. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Like, the last time I bought an iPod Touch on there, here's the thing. All the little listings on these sites, like the, the eBay and the Craigslist, and I'm not knocking them because it's an amazing thing if you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if you're just a mere mortal, like, average person that's just buying one thing a year, it's like there's little bombs in each one of the listings. It's like you read all this stuff, and it's like, Oh, by the way, I dropped it, and I'm not sure if it works anymore. It's like all the way at the end. <laughs> yeah. you know? You're like, wait, what? Um, so, you know, just buy it from like one of these reputable sellers. Um, the other thing is the service that you go with. Mm -hmm. I think you'd probably be better served with like an MVNO. Like, I don't know if you need like the $90 AT&T or Verizon plan. I think maybe look at Sprint that always has like these flash sales. And it's like you can get it sometimes for 25 bucks a month. Uh, Cricket is really good. If you're getting an unlocked phone refurbished, Cricket is a fantastic deal. Mm -hmm. It's like $35 a month. You get a couple gigs of data, and um, you don't have to really worry about a huge bill. Right. You've gone this long without a bill for your cell phone. Yeah. You know? I am a proud Sprint user. I think now I don't care whether you prefer Android or, or Apple. I know Now that I know that you would recommend Sprint, because not another, everyone here makes fun of me when I say I have Sprint. I, no, I, I didn't know you had Sprint. I would totally make fun of you for that. <laughs> in your position. You're talking about a guy who's 58 who's never had a cell phone in his life. Anything is going to be better than what he has. He's not going to know that Sprint doesn't have service in like 99% of the places is that fine. you want. It. I'm loyal. Like I, you know, it was my first um, provider and I, I, I don't switch. I was a huge Sprint. When they started Sprint PCS, I remember the billboards. They were clear. Mm -hmm. It was all digital. It was like the most amazing service. I was a huge Sprint user. Mm -hmm. And then, they, you know, I've changed over the years. Um, to buy the iPhone probably because you couldn't I buy did. the iPhone. And guess what? AT&T was the worst network. Mm -hmm. I remember, I'll never forget walking down the street in New York City after I just spent $600 or whatever it was for the original iPhone, calling my best friend, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have the new iPhone. He goes, well, that's amazing, but I can't hear you at all, so why don't you try calling me from a real phone? And I was like, you got to be kidding. And I really, I did, at and was so bad. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten a lot better, obviously, in those years. Um, but Sprint, uh, his phone will not take advantage of the new network, the 600 megahertz or whatever, mm -hmm. but I think he'll be fine. Yeah. You know, it depends. It's all about, if your phone works where you work and where you live, mm -hmm. those are the two main things. And like, obviously your drive, you know, like I've, even I have Verizon and my one part where I drive home, there is a spot in LA where it's a dead spot and it just drops out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My house is like that. What? <laughs> but Megan. we don't make phone calls. Like I'm on Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi calling. Okay. We have Wi-Fi so, calling. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I think, I think you can get around it. Yeah. Does it work here? Uh, yeah, it does. I'm pretty sure it does. Very hesitant. I don't make phone calls anymore. Like, I don't like to... It does It does work here, mostly. In certain conference rooms, it won't oh work. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. See, where I work, um, only T-Mobile or Verizon works. So, like, for me, like, AT&T and Sprint are, like, almost like I can't... It's like a non-starter because I, we have Wi-Fi at my work, but I kind of... I don't want to rely on that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I want my phone to have, like, strong signal, like, even without that. And it's stuff. I work in a fortress. It's a studio. You know, it's like a, literally a fortress. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like here, it's kind of, you're in the middle of a, right. you know. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. So, um, But if you want an Android, by the way, let me just, one oh, more yeah. recommendation. It, uh, name again? Mike. Mike. Mike, if you want an Android, my recommendation is if you're an Amazon Prime member, which you may not be because if you're 58 without a cell phone, I don't know. Um, but uh, the Amazon Prime exclusive phones are really good deals. 
So um, go on Amazon, search Prime exclusive cell phones. They sell them unlocked. They have some really good ones that are kind of expensive, like 400 bucks, but they have some really cheap ones that are like as low as like 35, maybe like 60 bucks. How do they, do they send you ads or what, what's the deal? They used to until I think there was like a lawsuit or something and yeah. Amazon can't do that anymore. So uh, you see this? So there you go, Moto X, fourth generation, 250 bucks. Moto G6, 32 gigs, that's a great phone. That's a fantastic phone. LG G6 Plus, look at this, the Moto G6 Play, 189 bucks. Um, I mean, these are great, look at that, the Moto E, probably wouldn't recommend that one, it might be a little too low end, but you never know. But anyway, these are always a fantastic deal. So in general, if you need a secondary phone, you're in between iPhones, whatever, um, you know? Well, some people, they, they wait because their screen cracks and yeah. like they're literally, they'd rather go without a phone right. than not have an iPhone or something. Like, yeah. just get this for yeah. the meantime. That, and they're not doing anything shady on tracking you or anything with that? No. I mean, uh, they were doing the ad thing, right. but they took that all off. Okay. So it's actually like a decent deal. Mm. So. All right. You know, if you want shady tracking, you have to go with like a, what was the company? Blue? Blue Mobile? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing I would, the ones in the grocery store, those can Don't be suspect. Don't get those. Yeah. Don't get those. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think we've we've done everything we can do for you um, here. <laughs> I wanted to tell you we have a new podcast. Uh, it's called Valley of Genius. Yes, it's good. I listened it, to the Steve Wozniak. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah, he ate at the what was the place he ate at that like Leo some, kept saying? Yeah, it was barbecue. Like, the Hickory Pit. Yeah, Hickory Pit Hickory. or Hickory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I tried to find it because I was in uh, Cupertino, yeah. but I could not remember for the life of me uh, what the name was. Hickory and, Pit. Ah, should yeah. just called you. Yeah, you should. Yeah, I, yeah. Don't ask Siri. Ask Megan. Um, it was the Hickory Pit. Yeah, I love this episode. I love Steve Wozniak. So there's lot, lots of episodes uh, from with hackers and founders. And um, Adam Fisher is an author, well-known author. And he had uh, all these conversations that uh, he used as the basis of his book, um, uh, Valley of Genius. And uh, he is using these uh, interviews. And Leo and Adam chat about them and give them context. And it's a really great podcast. It's something a little slightly different than what we normally do, um, and I love it, and it's audio only. And you can subscribe to our Amazon Flash Briefing, as we talked about before. Subscribe, subscribe to Riches, too, because um, you might have different stuff than we have. And subscribe to our newsletter. Do you also have a newsletter? Uh, you know what? I don't. I do have a book, though. Yeah, the handy tech tips for the iPhone. Yes. I, uh, I have looked at some of your tips, and I am always a fan. It's always something that I haven't, um, that I didn't already know. You know what the scariest part about writing this book was? The Amazon reviews. Because, you know, like in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, it's the greatest book ever. But I'm just like waiting, you know, don't read the YouTube comments. But mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you go on Amazon, and it like actually it has like great reviews. And like I knew, like I was like, I think that this is going to be good. Yeah. But like you never really know until you right. put it out there. Right. And the reviews have actually, like I just checked the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, they're actually, like people are learning. Yeah. And that was my goal. Like yeah. the whole goal was just like, anyway. Because there's so many things that the iPhone can do. And often when you just like Google, like what to do with the iPhone, it's garbage. Well, like, it, it, it can also be outdated. Yeah. Like mine will be on Monday when they release iOS 12. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I'll be rewriting my book now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that like, you can find the stuff online, but sometimes it's tough. And also, my audience, that you know, my KTLA audience, mm -hmm. is kind of like drive-by tech. Like they're not sitting there; they're not power Google users. Mm -hmm. Like I can figure out like what the best tip is online and like see where it is. Right. But like my mom can't, you yeah. know. And I wrote the book for those people. Yeah. Did your mom read it? <clears throat> my mom has Android. Oh, interesting. But yeah. you said earlier you wouldn't get your mom Android. No, I said I'm going to switch her now. Oh. Here's the thing. Um, I got her the Pixel because she wanted the best pictures in the world. And I actually tried to switch her to an iPhone, and she said no. She mm -hmm. goes, my pictures are too good. Mm -hmm. She goes, everyone asks me about my pictures. It's like a little thing, I guess, in like the, you know, in her mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Oh, They're like, interesting. Ooh, who, how'd you get that? Well, such did, a good did she have, because we have one friend in our um, book group who switched to the Pixel, and you now our iMessage. them out of the group. No, she's still in there, but it's our, our iMessage group is a mess. It's not the same. No. I know. No. My wife, her like little group at work is all, you know, iPhone, iMessage, mm -hmm. and her phone is just all day long. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, even though it still comes through, it's like an MMS, and mm -hmm. people just get weirded out. They're like, yeah. eh, this isn't as fun yeah. anymore. Well, because instead of the little heart next to the message, it says, like, so-and-so loved that, yeah. or, you know, so-and-so, you know, I don't even know what the exclamation point is, but it's something that yeah. wastes my time. It gives you, like, the whole message again. It looks like a message, yes. but it's like the yeah. message, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, they like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. weird. 
But uh, I don't judge people on Android, really. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, subscribe to the show, twit.tv slash TNSS. And uh, Rich is going to be back tomorrow on The Tech Guy and next weekend with Jason and... Um, the next weekend. And the weekend after that. Just... <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks it's been fun. It thanks for having fun. me. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.